Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! Welcome to the Metal Voice. Today we have the, the main metal man himself. <laughs> yes, none other than Carl Kennedy. You know, I, I used to pronounce your name Kennedy. Do a lot of people do that? Everybody does that. It's and Kennedy, it's perfectly though. fine. It's Kennedy, it's right? Ca it's Kennedy would it's be Kennedy. the correct. But we found that um, at the Civil War, one of our ancestors signed with an X joining the Civil War. And I think he was joining for the Union. And it was where it became from Kennedy, like K-E-N-N, -N, to C-A-N. And when he signed with an X, they, what they believe, the genealogy uh, family members believe that that's when he he couldn't read or write and so somebody spelled it for him and that's when it changed and it's been nothing but a problem for me my entire life and i would like to go back and just slap that guy and say listen <laughs> a b c d let's get it together and write the freaking name you only have to work so it's irish first and last it's, it's irish yeah it, it is yeah. okay so um, today on the show, we're going to talk about your new album or your latest release that was released, I think in May, and it's going to be a hard copy release coming in August, right? Yes. Just a few weeks now, three weeks. Just a, it's called warrior from your band, the Kennedy band, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Correct. I, I, you know, I, I, again, I'll, I, I'll be honest with you. I listened to it like once, two, three times, just as I'm working in the background and I really enjoyed it. It's classic. Metal. How would you describe this new album, Warrior, which I have in back of me? How would you describe it? You know, I mean, it's it's hard for me to describe it. I would have to say, you know, it's the best album that's ever been recorded in the history of music. <laughs> but reality is, I think it's a. Re I'm really proud of the album. I think it's. Uh, I think it's a great album. But I do think it's traditional metal, and a lot of people have said, you know, it's traditional but it's modern at the same time. So with a modern twist or whatever. So I thought that was a good fit for it because we all listen to new music and we all have same roots. So a lot of that comes out in the music as well. So we're bringing new ideas and approaches to things as well as traditional feels. And I should set, set this up a little bit better when I first introduced you, you know, you're the drummer for the rods. You're a producer who's produced so many great uh, albums over the years, including the early years of Thrash, with, of course, Anthrax, with, of course, Overkill. And who am I missing out here? Uh, Blue Cheer, right? Well, they were in mm -hmm. Thrash. T.T. But... Quick, T. T. Overkill. Quick, Overkill, mm -hmm. yes. And, of course, the, the rich history of the Rods. Exciter. Exciter, yes. I almost forgot mm -hmm. about Dan Bueller and the boys. Uh, but let's talk about this new album. Then we'll go back into the past. And we might have a surprise guest if I could get him on. All right. Great. Love that. Um, all right. So tell me about the new album, Warrior. Why, why did you want to do this solo album? You got the rods as your musical output. But why did you want to do the Kennedy band and pull out Warrior? You know, I've been, I had moved here from Cortland to Scranton about 30 years ago. So I've been here for a long time. I still tell my friends I'm not from here and they laugh at me. You go, you know, after 10 years, pal, you're from here. But I still say I'm not from here. But yeah. I look for musicians, like-minded musicians. I've been wanting to do some little side project, write material with other people um, who are close. I couldn't find anyone. I found great musicians. I couldn't find like-minded people. I've been playing with the, the Jeffrey James Band. It's an eight-piece horn band here for 22 years. Of course, they have the percussionist jumps in when I go so I can travel whenever and uh, the drummers fill in. There are two drummers who fill in for me. But uh, so Tony, the bass player for Kennedy, joined about six years ago and Tony and I hit it off. And Tony, we always laugh because it's a cover band that Tony joined. Tony, when Black Sabbath, he was young and Black Sabbath, his first album. He just went into this parallel universe where it was all heavy music for his entire life. He doesn't know pop music. It cracks us up because we'll say, oh, what about this? You know, that no, I never heard that sound. It just is the parallel heavy metal universe. So Tony and I hit it off. We were a very strong rhythm section. So he was in a band, TLC, Totally Lost Cause. No hot chicks, just three guys, four guys, you know, who were, I guess, okay looking, but not the hot chick band. Not that band. TLC. The other not, one. Yeah, not that band. Not the, the cool looking band. And... So they had, their drummer was just unable to uh, 
continue with them because they were starting to write and he was unable to continue. And they had a TV show, they had a commitment. So they said, would you do this TV show with us? So I learned some songs and I did the TV show and it went well and it went so well, we decided that, hey, let's get together at the recording studio one day a week. And what we'll do is we'll just start writing. And that's what we did for a year and a half or more. And all of a sudden, one day we woke up and, and it sounds funny, but it was really that organic, no plan. We actually become a band and we had an album of material we were really proud of. And so we started recording. And by the time we got it to Chris Collier, who mixed it, um, you know, this is this was the album that came from that. So and there was no plan. And then we were talking about what do we release it as? And I'd had the Kennedy album out and the logo. And so we're like, you know what, let's just call it Kennedy. So it was. I know it sounds a little Forrest Gump, but it is. It was yeah. that simple. There's no master plan. Yeah, you know, it is a traditional heavy metal album. I mean, it's a little thrash there. And I'm going to describe it for people so they could get a gist of it, right? Who haven't heard it. A little power metal. I would say power metal, right? Great vocals. Great vocals. It's a Mike, right? Mike. Uh, Mike, yeah. And Mike Satur does it. Every, he delivers every time out. Unbelievable. Yeah. I think my favorite song in the album is Atia. It's the last one. Is it pronounced mm -hmm. Atia? Mm -hmm. That's it like is. the big single for me. That's, that's your big one there. That's, that's your, big, uh, mm -hmm. your big single there. But it's not released yet. As, are you going to release that as a single? Yeah, you know, I'm Good. up for anything. You know, like I said, we really have no plan. That's why, you know, we were, we were looking at this album, sitting here, like, okay, we're ready to go. And then COVID-19 hits. We played one yeah. gig, and it yeah. went great. And now we're screwed. Now we're like, well, well there are no gigs. I can't get this band to play any dates you know, even local dates. Yeah. And we've got this album. What are we going to do? So I started talking to my friends in the industry and they're like, well, some of the press people are getting back to us um, who normally don't I'm like, you know what, then let's just put this out digitally for now and then we'll yeah. release it after. And so it was a big move to do, but I think it was the right move for us because we're a baby band. It doesn't matter that some people know of me, you know, um, it's the band. Nobody knows. It's a brand new band. But I would never, at this point in my life, would I have started a band? No. Because yeah. the Rods, I think we just made, and thank you, number three. I mean, that was that was incredible for the, the new Rods Brotherhood of Metal. Look at that. He's got it right there. You didn't He's think I'd pull it out. What did you? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the Rods, we just made one of our best albums since our first album, in my opinion. Yeah. And, um, and now we're working on the next album, Shockwave, which is going really well. So... You know, having this as a band wasn't really the plan, but it's turned out so well, and I'm excited. And Okay, you know. now that you opened a can of worms on the rods, the new album, okay, is this a mm -hmm. new singer that's singing all the songs? He's going to be your vocalist now and take over for Okay, so that I'm glad you asked me that. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really great question. I've been getting that a couple. Some people are, like, really cool with it, and some people who've known the band realize that Rick Cottle, Shmulek Avigal, you know, we've had singers in the band, you know? Yes, you have. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not like, oh my God, this what's happening here? But we call David. We call him the the right Reverend Rock. You know, David Rock. That's his. I call him Rock. You know, so David, or as I call him Rock, we call him the right Reverend Rock because when he starts talking to the crowd, it's a freaking. He's like a like a gospel. Like it's a sermon. He's preaching to the masses. And, you know, we can't lose that. The guy is so great with the crowd, and he loves the crowd, and, and uh, they seem to love him. But he and Mike are working, and they're trading vocals, and Mike is doing an incredible job of, on the older material, elevating it, taking, adding some things that weren't there because of his vocal talent. And so it's working out. So they're trading vocals. David's still going to sing. You'll still hear him singing songs, but Mike, he and Mike will be singing them together. David will sing all the harmonies with him. So for those who are concerned that they won't hear David's voice, well, you know, I mean, no panic. I, you know what? Okay. Dave is not, you know, he's not no Bruce Dickinson, but he's got a tone, right? And it's recognizable. Oh, he's got a style. I love his that's style. It. Right? That's right. I love I've, it too, man. Like the brother. I've always he pushed him to sing job. more. Yeah, yeah, I've always pushed him to, you know, you have a style and, you know, of course you're not like the three octave range, but you definitely come across and you deliver the songs very, very well. And, and, and by the way, just so everybody, I'm going to big, uh, I'm going to promote this album. It's, it's a fantastic album and it's very well produced. Songs are great. And that's at the end of the day, all the Rod's albums are about songs, nice, catchy tunes, right? So a big plug for the Brotherhood of Metal. Okay. So, 
adding adding Mike just to yes. finish with this with the Rollins. Yes. Adding Mike, um, it was seemed like the right time. David and I we write a lot of material and we write material that has now remember David started with Ronnie, you know, yeah. worked with Ronnie Dio for forever, and those are his roots. Yeah. Um, so he loves working with singers and he loves working with a more developed vocal style. And I write those as well. And so, but we, you know, we work within the limitations of the rods and we always say we have a standing joke in the band, which is if one of us brings in a song, if it's more than three chords, it takes more than five minutes to learn. It's not a good rod song. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so with Gary retiring from the band, which, you know, we were sad to see Gary retire and we waited and hoped he would change his mind. But, you know, Gary was, he'd seen the world and Gary was ready to just retire. So with that, we wanted a keyboard player. We wanted a vocalist and we wanted to just make some changes. You know, we've been doing this, we wanted to stay true to ourselves, which I don't, I don't think we'll ever, even with a singer. And even if we add a keyboard player, it'll still be the rods. There's no panic, yeah. but nonetheless, we wanted to have that little expansion and we thought this is the best time. So that's what's going on. And I think people will be surprised because the music is remarkably rods, despite Carl, the changes. We're, okay, so Shockwave is the new album, right? Shockwave. That's the, work, that's the working That's title. the working title. Okay. And, so, I'm, and, and Jimmy, I'm pushing for that because I have, I have titled every album we've done, which is all of, it's been the kiss of death for every album. I don't want to break that streak. <laughs> all right. So Shockwave. <laughs> Yes. You said, you know, there's a couple of songs. How much of it has been completed? Uh, we're about four songs in. Okay. Recorded or just we have the songs? I have, and... I have two. My drums are right behind me. I have two drum tracks ready to put down. Okay. And uh, the other two tracks are, are, will be ready to go soon. Along so, with, so... we have a lot of ideas. So we'll be, you know, we really feel a little bit of pressure, you know, because, um, and we don't, of course, we're not going to let it get to us because the rods are the rods. But uh, this last album was really good. And we want this next album to be very good because any one of these albums could be the last rods album. So we want to make it as good as we can songwriting wise. Um, and what, what would you say the musical direction is? It's the rods, you know, I mean, David and I from day one, when we played so five, together, under five minutes, <laughs> just three chords. And that's that. Yep. Yeah. Take don't take longer than five minutes to learn. No more than three chords. We're we're in. Now I think we'll stretch out a little bit, but nothing that's crazy, you know. And if you listen to the first album, songs like Music Man and some of the things, and we develop those live as well to add to them. Th there are elements, you know, that somewhat orchestrated in those within the confines of that type of music. So you yeah. know, it's, that's so, what it'll be again. Nobody will be surprised. Nobody will be dis if you love the Rods. Most likely, you'll still like. What we're doing. great great and, and what's what's this sort of time frame what do you like i, I get it COVID 19 and all that yes no i think it has to be we're really we're really working hard i just uh, talked to david today about my coming up again to work on some of the material to keep us moving forward we want to get it done we don't want to wait um, so, are you, so you're saying you know we'll do this before 2021 i'm hoping by the end of the year we'll have this album done Oh, good. That's, the, yeah, that's just, pretty refreshing. I mean, no, the, only, the only thing that will be, uh, you know, if we don't feel we have enough songs, but I think we'll, we're on track. Okay. And a lot of people don't know this, and I've talked to Dave about this. You guys opened up for Ozzy on the Blizzard of Oz tour in the UK. What are your fond memories of, you know, the Randy Rhodes era, you know, with the Blizzard of Oz back in the day? Well, Actually, we opened for, did we do Ozzy in the UK? I thought we did Ozzy. We did Ozzy dates here in the States. Oh, yeah, yeah. My correct, correct. It was Iron Maiden in the UK. And it was Iron Ozzy. Maiden in the UK. Iron right. Maiden in the UK and Ozzy Those, in, in, in North America. Right. Well, sticking with Ozzy for a minute, we, we show up and we're in the dressing room and Randy Rhodes is down the hall. And Randy Rhodes, we're in the dressing room. We're all excited. And it's kind of an we place, but all of a sudden we hear the loudest guitar playing we've ever heard. He must have had a Marshall stack is all we could think of. It was so freaking loud that we literally were talking to each other and our lips were moving and we couldn't hear each other. And he's way down the hall. But Randy Rhodes was playing all of the stuff that, you know, all of the modes, all the sweet picking, nothing you hear on the albums. He was playing 
way stuff that was way ahead of anything he was doing on the Ozzy album. And uh, it, it was incredible. And we were all in awe, like hearing all these fast modal kind of playing and just ripping and we were blown away while he was warming up. We couldn't talk to each other. So all we could do was just sit and listen. You, you weren't him. allowed. Did you, you had no conversations with Randy? We, Not even a, Hey, <laughs> good yeah, job. No. Yeah. We said hi, but we, I mean, he was in the dressing room at the time. So we only saw them in passing, you know, yeah, Ran, yeah. and Rudy was great. Rudy Lone Gary, a bass strap and you know, everybody was cool. Tommy Aldrich. And I always tell this story and one day Tommy and Aldrich and I will meet again. And I'm sure he'll want to punch me, but you know, that whole deep purple, um, Elf thing. A lot of the road crew from Deep Purple um, were from Elf and from the Rods. They went would go on the road and stayed with Deep Purple for years. And so Ox, who was, became Tommy Aldrich's roadie, okay, drum tech. So we're playing one a Utica Arena or somewhere, and uh, the first night I see Tommy Aldrich when I'm doing my drum solo. He's looking out from behind the curtain side stage. I'm playing, I look over, and I see him like, wow, Tommy Aldrich, because I've stolen so much from Tommy Aldrich, I should probably send him monthly checks. <laughs> but he's looking over at me, and I, then suddenly he sees me, and he darts away. So the next night, we're in the arena, and I walk up to him, and I, I go, hey, you know, Tommy, he's just sitting there, and I go, Tommy, I have to tell you, I'm one of my favorite drummers, you know, I just think you're phenomenal, and, uh, you know, I love watching you play, I love you know, listening to you play, you're really a great drummer. And he just turns his head and doesn't say a word. Jeez. And Ox looks at me and he just goes, you know, what could Ox do? He's my friend, but would going to make Tommy talk to him? So I would have made him. That was, I would have made him. Was, if I was there, I would have made him talk to you. And I'm sure he's a really great guy. I don't know what the problem was. Maybe he was in a bad mood. Yeah. But it was my it. first experience with, because I studied with Carmine Apathy. Oh, yeah. And, Carmine's great. When, when I was 19. Yeah. And Carmine was phenomenal. He was totally no rock star. He was all about the music. He told me, you know, there was some kid in front of me who was playing, wanted to play fast. And well, I took double lessons because I drove in. And the mm -hmm. kid's talking about I play fast. I go, wow, that's all that kid talked about. And he said, you know, if you're playing because you want to get laid, you're playing because you want to get rich, and you're playing because you want to be famous, because, you know, you may know that may happen. If you play because you love it, it'll last your whole life. And I'm experiencing that now. And I've passed that on so many times. Yeah. But uh, that was my first, my first time experiencing that. Be careful of your heroes when you meet them. <laughs> That's right. Um, and then flip into the UK, I mean, the number of the beast tour with, with Iron right. Maiden, right? right? I mean, you, you, you actually were on the two most iconic tours of, of, of metal history, right? What was it like? Bruce Dickinson, Paul Diano's out, Bruce Dickinson's in, Number of the Beast. Right. What, what were your thoughts? Like, oh my God, these guys are amazing. Or maybe you just thought, oh, no, okay, they they're... No, and the first night they came in with champagne and welcomed us and uh, they, they were the best. And uh, we were treated very well on that tour. And, uh, you know, Clive and I became friends. I used to sit behind him, stand behind him and watch him play. Like he was up on a huge drum rise and he looked down and smiled, you know, sometimes. But Clive was great. I was sad to see him go. I understood why, but but because uh, I love Nico. Nico's been such a big addition to the band. But Clive was a great guy. And, and his little Phil in uh, Run to the Hills, little Tom, descending Tom Phil, single stroke roll. That's just such a great hook. But it was great. And, and Bruce was just stronger and stronger every night. And uh, the band was phenomenal, you know, so it was a great tour for us. We were going down really well with the crowd. All the fans were excellent. So we were very fortunate to be on that tour. And of course, after that, we came back and then ACDC wanted us on their tour. There you go. And uh, so I'm sure you heard the story from David that, you know, our manager in his infinite wisdom uh, declined. It was a buy on and Arista UK put up, I think it was 25,000, but Arista US to decline and so we're like well we'll just take the money and we'll put it up and he's like no you're not going to borrow that money to do it not going to happen boys you're not going on the tour but it would have been a huge one for us dave talked to me a lot about you know his brotherhood with uh with ronnie james dio mm -hmm. and you know growing up and uh you know the crossword puzzles and <laughs> family yeah. feud and uh mm -hmm. you know a lot of sort of like little moments they had together um i mean you know they're cousins right they grew up together 
Mm-hmm. And I, I guess Ronnie, you must have had you must have had a connection with Ronnie too. I mean, being around David, being around Ronnie. Yes, and Ronnie loved David. I mean, they they had that was a you know the familial thing yeah. they had. I mean, there's no doubt that Ronnie just loved David, and uh, you know, and, and Rock as well. Loved loved Ronnie, um, and Ronnie was a great guy. So, and you know, for me, that whole the whole thing with I was in a band called Raw Meat one of the worst names, but the band was really great. Had a, yeah. Dave, Dave Porter from 805. I don't know if you've ever heard of the band, but an excellent band. No. Frank Briggs was a drummer, David, you know, on RCA. And then, but anyway, they, we rehearsed in the same house with, as Elf. We were in the garage, which was finished, and they were in the house, and they would rehearse. So we saw these guys in passing all the time. And so I'd known them for a long time. I used to go see them before that when it was a high school dance and everybody danced, except when Elf played, everybody sat on the floor and nobody danced, even though they were playing cover material. They were a concert band right from the get go. And uh, so, you know, those guys, Elf, and I became friends with, with the guys at Elf anyway, because of all that time together. So, uh, you know, it was very sad, Ronnie passing. He was such a great guy. And I was such an honor for me to have uh, him sing the code, the song I had written. Uh, like a career highlight for me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And David, you know, Ronnie was singing two songs and we had gone to, uh, gone to a couple of shows right before. And then radio city was right before when he came up to sing the songs, but it was, David was gracious enough because Ronnie was going to sing two songs and David could have, we knew he was going to sing metal will never die because we had worked on that it was the perfect song for Ronnie. But you know, we had other songs and Ronnie was willing to sing them and David could have said, no, I'm going to do one of yours, but or one of my own. David's always been a big supporter of my material. And you know, I always thank him for that because that was truly a career highlight. And Ronnie coming in, David had always told me, Ronnie's a one take guy. Now yeah. I've produced over 40 albums. I've worked with some great singers and I know how it works. I love working with vocalists and you know, most of the time you can get through 90% of a song, but even the great singers, but not everything is perfect or you want to redo it because a little thing, a little phrasing, a little timing. Ronnie nailed it every time he was first take. I'm like blown away. I, David goes, you thought I was joking. I go, I thought that so much time had passed from when you recorded with Ronnie that, you know, your memory was a little skewed, you know, like we all think that. <laughs> that's like, right. You know, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so like, oh, yeah, you know, he's really, you know, and I was like, like, oh, my God, it's unbelievable. I had never seen anything like that. It was it was just amazing. And then Ronnie would listen to my crappy demo and my voice on it. Right. Which is just horrific. Like, oh, my God, please. He's going to live, you know, and Ronnie, Ronnie would say, Carl, do you mind if I change this little piece? I'm like, please, carte blanche, yeah. whatever you want. You know, the greatest metal, in my opinion, the greatest metal singer of all time. So, sure. so for him, but that's, that was Ronnie, very polite asking, you know, do you mind if I change this melody a little bit? And like, you know, it was and, amazing. And, and as we go down memory lane, let's not forget Kennedy's album warrior that will be released August when? 15th. August 15th. That's the hard copy CD. Is it going to be unreleased on vinyl? Vinyl with a splatter, a cool three different splatters. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about that. Because and the label? The label is Sleazy Rider. Is it going to be Greece. available on uh, Amazon and all the regular sort of uh, distribution it's channels? Ev- it's everywhere, yes. It'll okay. be everywhere. All right. And now we continue our journey down memory lane. Johnny Zazula. You hook up uh, with Johnny, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of great thrash albums you've done over the years with him. Uh, being a Canadian, exciter, right? Violence and force. Yeah. What was it like exciter. being in the studio? What were the high points and the low points of being in the studio with uh, Exciter back in the day? I think the low point we'll start with. The low point was that, you know, the studios then, you, first of all, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of time. And it was trying to capture a great John's guitar sound because John is such a massive, great tone. And, yeah. you know, I wish we could have done a better job on that. But with the limitations we had, um, you know, we did the best we could. But everything else, those guys are the greatest guys. They are. And Dan Beeler is just a killer drummer, but an amazing vocalist. And then he can do both at the same time. So. <laughs> You know, that's even more amazing. But they were the best guys. They were the easiest to work with. We had a lot of fun. And um, it was a great session. And 
I love those guys to this day. We did a show with them a couple of years ago in uh, New York, and it was great to see them again. Do you find and they because, were just as good as ever? Oh yeah. Do you find because there was so little money and there was so little time that more pre-production, getting the songs down, and then going in and just knocking out of the park, and that's what's missing today. We just have too much time. We have no deadlines, so we kind of. It's not right. as that's right. The, if you have a deadline today, it's a self-imposed deadline. Yes, it's different. It's no. different when you know, God, we're never going to get this record done if we don't do this, right? I wish, in hindsight, I wish that we had had what we were doing, renting a house, like we did with Anthrax for spreading the disease. We worked pre-production in Long Island, and and then we came to Ithaca, and then we still had time. So. I wish we had had that kind of time because I would have said, looking at it today, I would have said, we need to go into the pre-production until we are, everything is just nail it. And then go to a great studio for a very short period of time, but a studio that can, with engine, a top engineer, who can capture the sound of the band and, and do it. And I agree with you, but today it's, you know, it's just, it can go on forever with my album. For the first Kennedy solo album, I let things go in my drum tracks. I didn't want Beat Detective. I'm like, I don't, people know I can play the drums, but if there's little glitchy things here or whatever, it's real and I don't want to change it. You know, otherwise yeah. I could have just programmed the drums. Yeah, yeah. And, and it makes a difference. I mean, also we had less songs on an album, right? Which makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have right. eight songs versus like 15 songs, you know, it's, there, there's a lot yeah, more that's right. filler, right? Yeah, and, and, and you're concentrating more. You're, you're targeting more and less songs. Anyways, I, I think the deadlines and the great producers who were working within those deadlines really made a difference. And that's why these albums are classics. A lot of people come up to me and go, look, Jimmy, we had no money for this album. But it's still not the same because there was no pre-production done. There was, you weren't, they weren't playing those clubs endlessly, fine-tuning right. the songs, right? Uh, they do, well, that's what it is today, and that's what it is. You can't change it. How about Overkill? Feel the fire. I mean, there's a groundbreaking debut right there. Unbelievable. Right? Well, Blitz, what can you say about Blitz? And Didi's, you know, great. Um, but those guys were all rat, was a cool guy. You know, they were all monsters, and uh, it's just a killer band. But Blitz is a force to be reckoned with just unto himself. When you listen to them today, you go, oh, my God, they're still going on strong, right? There's the yes. Relentless yes. is I the just, word. I just saw Bobby in California. with. I was uh, guest drumming it for a band, and we were out there. at uh, The band held hostage. They have a new album out okay. uh, with Tim Ripper Owens on it. And I was out there. Open, we were opening direct support for uh, Metal Allegiance, and, uh, yes. and Bobby was there. And, you know, we got to a little reunion, but what a great guy. But, man, he's just. You know, he's singing as powerfully as ever. All right. Um, what about, well, we'll get to like the debut album by Anthrax, but what about, like you mentioned, you know, Armed and Dangerous, Spraying mm -hmm. the Disease. When you look back at these albums, you go, do you want to fix them? Is there, is there something to fix? Or are you saying, you know what, that's a piece of history right there. You know, it's probably one of the most loved Anthrax albums, you know, uh, Spraying the Disease, mm -hmm. at least what right. I get from people, right? I, I get that too, a lot of people, and I read that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love to go back and, like, like, I always thought that doing a remix of those albums would be a great idea. The one thing that I work for, for the bands, yep. I always work, whether I've succeeded to make a, a great album or not, I, my goal has always been to capture the band's energy. I always try to recognize what it is they have. And I've always tried to realize their vision as best I can, but I always push them to capture that energy in a recording. And I think that's there. And of course, Charlie would just go out there and yeah. uh, like oh, playing yeah. gung ho. He's just a, a monster. And Charlie went out and just nailed it. You know, it's phenomenal drummer. How'd you meet Johnny, by the way, Johnny Z? Johnny was, I'm trying to think, he had released an album uh, by someone, somebody, maybe it was a Man of War album, something, but somebody's, his name came up. And so I just said, yeah, let me give him a call. And I called him and said, look, I'm, I'm producing, you know, if you have a project, I'd love to uh, work with you. Yeah. And that was it. It was simple as that. Uh, let's just talk about Fistful of Metal. All right. And, yeah. you know, here's a groundbreaking 
album for a band that's done very well for themselves. And you're part of that history. You know, you were on, you did, you uh, produced the first, I guess, three albums by Anthrax, right? Mm -hmm. The EP and the two albums. Mm -hmm. To me, it's always been like one of my favorite albums. I I became friends with Neil because of that album. Mm -hmm. I mean, low budget, right? Every Very low budget. Every take counts. What did you think about it? Like, I mean, what were the, the, the pros and the cons of just doing that album? Well, the pros were that these guys were great. And I mean, Neil opens his mouth and he's unbelievable. You know, I mean, what a powerful singer. Um, they knew what they wanted. Anthrax, in any of the incarnations, they are dialed in. They know what they want and they go after it ferociously and i love that because that's how the rods were that's what we were single-minded and they were single-minded in purpose as well um the limitations were that initially we we got to a point where we worked very very well but the guitar playing you know they were new yeah. so it's under a microscope getting everything to be spot on was it was difficult dan Lilker is a great what a brilliant brilliant musician danny is but Danny didn't play with a pick, so I really forced him to play with a pick, which was, you know, you're bringing in people, they're kind of green, and now all of a sudden it's, you know, you're asking them to do something out of the comfort zone. But Dan Loker made me feel really great because I thought Dan was going to bust me. A few years ago in Chicago, uh, they were headlining Nuclear Assault, and we were right before them. And um, we're sitting at a table and we're going to have dinner and, and Dan comes over and of course he's really tall and I'm sitting down and he's standing over me he goes, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, Oh, oh here we go. We're going to have some bad story to tell about me being a prick back in the day. And he sits down and he's so nice. And he said, you know, I have to thank you. You changed my, the way I played. And if I hadn't switched to playing with a pick, that totally changed everything for me. And I want to thank you for that. And I thought, wow, that was fantastic because I really thought he was going to bust me on giving him such a hard time back then. But so the, really the thing was to, I knew how they sounded. I knew how anthrax sounded. I knew how powerful they were, but the challenge was to make sure that the rhythm guitars were tight. The solos were in sync and that the bass was pumping. Charlie from day one was never an issue. Charlie was just go out there, done. He was the one take guy, but then dialing everything into that. And uh, so that was the challenge, but those guys picked it up fast. And by then um, Dan Spitz, we laughed because Danny Spitz, he would stand on behind the console between the speakers and he would just, after a while, he would just look at me. Okay, do it again. Like we just would created this synergy and it was just an easy working situation. And, but the bottom line was that time, was, as we went along the timeline of what we had, it kept getting shorter and shorter for the vocals. And of course, my mistake was not letting, I was so worried about having pristine quality sound with what we had, which were limitations, so that I didn't just let Neil do his vocals. I was worried that we'd be just destroying them with take after take, so I wanted them to sound great. So we wind up compressing Neil's time where the poor guy had to sing them in a very short period of time. And, you know, that's, I've apologized to him for that. You know, that was a young producer and, you know, just worried about the technical side as well, but I should have said, screw that. We'll polish it up in the mix. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but maybe that's what adds to the charm of the record. Maybe if, again, you had all the time in the world, all the time to do the vocals. That's I think true. it came out great. You don't know how it would have turned out otherwise. I, right. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you rethink things and then you wind up losing that energy. There's an urgency that uh, is on that album. Neil had to do it and it was a lot of pressure for him, but he rose to the occasion because he kills it on that album. Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I got to tell you, be, just for me, I could speak that I bought, I heard it on the radio in Montreal and I bought the album. And then after I found out when Neil wasn't on in the band anymore, I just didn't follow Anthrax. <laughs> I got, and, and I only appreciated them later on. I got into them later on with the John Bush era and the Joy Belladonna. But I was kind of like, that right. was the draw for me back then. It was the voice over the music. And the music was great too, don't get me wrong. And the production. I mean, it was just that lineup. And I, I was just sad that that lineup didn't continue on for a few more albums. But that's just right. me. But that's just me. I can't. Well, no, I think that. And I think that um, I think that when they came back, um, they came back with 
Matt Fallon. I think that's his name, the singer. Yeah. And, um, you know, so whatever issues they had with Neil or whatever they wanted, they chose to do, they came back with Matt Fallon. And Matt Fallon, after a week in the studio, he was not the guy. And, you know, I'm, I, I've told this story, but it's so true that I told the guys, you know, this is not the singer is going to get you to the major label because we were, they were right on the cusp and they, they were really needed to make a great record for the major label to pick them up. And so they were right there and it had to be that album. And when I told them that, they obviously knew and they said, get Johnny on the phone. So I called Johnny and I, Johnny said, put the band on the phone. They go into the conference room. Five minutes later, they come out and they said, Johnny wants to talk to you. I go into the, into the conference room. I pick up the phone. Hey, John, what's up? Put him on a bus and hung up the phone. <laughs> and so, you know, talk about a ballsy move. The band is the critical part. The music is recorded and now they have no singer. And this is, <laughs> And then they're in the studio and they've got the clock is ticking. And that, that's what I, why I have so much respect for, for Anthrax because those guys had the balls to do that. And if they hadn't done that, who knows where they would have wound up. Because that, that that, that's a album. pretty risky move. Like you, you get your success with one guy and then you have no that's singer. Right. And they, they're really lucky that it didn't go the other way, right? I well, mean, right. And I was able to find Joey Belladonna, my friend Andrew Duck McDonald. Yeah. We did the Thrash album together and, and uh, you know, he's played with Blue Cheer and kim simmons but i called called duck and he said look try this guy and so i called joey and he came in and it was clear right away that even though joey wasn't dialed in perfectly because you gotta remember that that speed that tempo was not what people were used to but yeah. joey was the right guy you know for the, the sound yeah. but they brought in this guy and I'm not, i don't mean to diss this guy matt fallon i don't really know him i met him for five or six days you know in the studio and he was young and and maybe wasn't as focused as he could have been but after neil to bring in matt was like what it, it made no sense to me and of course neil is a phenomenal singer so if you're going to bring in a singer it better be somebody who's amazing I always, just average. I, I always thought they still would have attained the same success. It would have been different with Neil. It would have been more of a Judas mm -hmm. Priest success. Uh, they would have attained it. He had the voice to deliver, you know, oh. at, a, at a sort of a high level. You know, you know, he had the professional voice. I mean, he, he was. I love that Neil is doing well now and doing really well in, in Death Rider. And I mean, I just think Neil is phenomenal. But you know, right after that, it was a tough go for Neil for a while, I think. And, yeah. and Neil should have been in uh, any of those bands that we've spoken of. You know, he should have been in that caliber of a band. I'm just surprised that no one snatched him up because he was phenomenal. And I think yeah. he just got a bad rep possibly from something and, and uh, maybe just wasn't making the connections. But Neil was the guy, you know. Yeah. Okay. Incredible. On that note, on that note, uh, I'll thank you very much. And I want to tell everybody, pick up Warrior. All right, traditional heavy metal album by Carl Kennedy, the band. Um, again, uh, The Rods coming out with a new album, not this one. This was the last one. You can pick <laughs> this one up too. Uh, look out for Shockwave. That's right. Before, the new album. before 2020. Um, and any final words you want to uh, throw out there? You know, thank you for, su for the support because, you know, especially now there are no live gigs. This is all there is and it means a lot. So thank you. I really appreciate yeah, it. For sure. And, and I always say to the fans, you know, I, sometimes people, like I was talking about an experience earlier. I love talking to the fans. I've made a lot of fans, a lot of friends over the years and they travel with us throughout Europe. And uh, I love that. I love that they show up and they'll follow us and, and we all hang out and have dinner together. And so, and so I always encourage fans, just come up, say hi, nobody's going to charge you for a meet and greet, you know, just look for us. And when I, when you say hi to me, I will say hi back and we'll have a conversation and who knows, maybe we'll become friends, but I definitely love meeting anybody who's into the band and wants to meet me. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you very much. Uh, and we will talk soon, my friend. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Get